Making a video every two months is really hard work. I deserve a break to watch something relaxing like this. Oh, sorry, my TV does that. All you have to do is restart it and you're good for another half hour or so. See? Works just fine. I mean, sure, it's annoying and yeah, it's hard to see with it being so small, but what do you expect me to do? Buy a new one? Because let's be real here, buying a new TV sucks. The industry is always focused on something stupid and expensive as hell like 3D or curved TVs. Yeah, they're cool and all, but they barely add anything to the experience of watching TV and double or triple the price. I mean, I don't know about you, but getting a new TV was a big thing in my family. It didn't happen often and cost quite a bit, so we made sure to do our research before getting one. We got lucky by choosing brands like Vizio that have lasted us a decade and are still kicking. Present company excluded. But to be fair, I've had this TV for eight years and it's on literally 24 seven because I'm too lazy to set a sleep timer. When we bought our last TV two years ago around the holidays, we priced out some TVs that were on sale. Back then, a 55 inch 1080p smart TV would run you about $700. The picture would be pretty okay. The audio was mediocre almost on purpose to get you to buy a soundbar from the same company that sold you the TV and smart TVs were pretty dumb. What do I mean by that? Well. I mean, have you used a smart TV before? They aren't dumb in the sense that no one used them. They're dumb in the sense that no one liked using them. And it all comes down to one word. Laggy. So fucking lag. Like, I swear to God, some of these TVs, even from Samsung and Vizio, take forever just to move even one option over. That is, if it even receives the button press in the first place. Why? Because one, most smart TVs use complex infrared remotes that take forever to beam the command. And more importantly, two, most smart TVs use proprietary clunky operating systems usually written for that specific series of television. And they stay that way because three, they seldom ever receive updates. And even when they do, most older TVs have to mess around with putting a zip file on the root of a flash drive that you had to copy from your computer and ugh! Like, raise your hand if your Blu-ray player has Netflix built into it. Yep, me too. Now keep your hand up if you actually use it. Didn't think so. You probably use a Chromecast, Roku, or Apple TV instead because the interface is way more intuitive and light years faster. There's a hell of a lot more apps because the ecosystem isn't nearly as limited as the smart TVs and they're fully featured because even the apps themselves get updated. Is it too much to ask for a reasonably priced smart TV that won't be obsolete in two years? Five inch 4K Roku TV? That thing must be really expensive. All right, what's the catch? I just don't get it. I've been staring at this TV for more hours than I'm comfortable saying on camera for the past three months, and I just don't understand how they gave this 4K TV a 1080p price. You would think that they cut corners somewhere, like maybe it isn't the brightest, most vivid picture in the world. Or the speakers sound like an iPhone. Or the design is hideous. I bought this TV on sale at a local Target store for just $400 after tax. And even now, I still consider it one of the most difficult purchases I've ever made. Why? Because never before have I been so impressed by a manufacturer that I had previously never heard about. I went in with the mindset that I would be debating between a notoriously good Samsung or Vizio TV, and I would only be torn between spending $500 for their flagship 1080p model or their high-end $700 4K model. But then I saw this, the TCL 55 US 5800, quite literally mounted right between the two Samsung and Vizio panels I was interested in. And it was brighter than both of them and it was more colorful than both of them. And it was cheaper than both of them. And that's when I asked myself the question you all have probably been wondering since you started watching this video.
Who the fuck is TCL? I had no idea. And that's what I think answers the question of how this TV got so cheap. While the quality of this TV is impeccable so far, the brand name is almost entirely unrecognizable for most consumers. Look, I'm not gonna lie to you. I've always thought TV reviews on YouTube were pretty weird, you know? Most of the ones I've seen are all about the latest $5,000 offering from LG or something that consists mainly of a guy standing in front of it saying, Wow, look how good this TV looks. Like, look, 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 like, oh my god. Like, and it doesn't really work because obviously we can't see a difference through a camera, especially through YouTube, so it ends up being more of a bragging video than anything else. And hear me out, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm the type of person to watch a plethora of videos about an electric car that's going to change the future, even though I can't afford a Model S. Yet. So I want to try something a little different. I want to show you a TV that gives the experience of a high-end panel for the price of a mid-range one. I want to walk you through how I finally decided on this TV, over its competition, and why it might be a good fit for you too. I want to tell you why I bought a 55-inch 4K TV for $400. Alright, so let's answer a few questions you might have about this TV. Question 1. Is 4K worth it in 2016? Eh, it's funny how this is still a question even though 4K panels have been out for a few years now. The main argument was always that 4K wasn't worth the price premium, but now that the price of 4K has come down, so has the price of 1080p, keeping the decision difficult for an even broader audience. The big problem is still the lack of 4K content on the market right now. Cable and satellite providers are still well behind the curve, with DirecTV being the only provider to offer any sort of broadcast 4K solution. One full-time 4K channel. They'll bump this up to three different channels for big sporting events like the Masters and more recently college football, but the point is it's still virtually non-existent. You have to remember that this is the same industry that is still broadcasting 720p and 1080i signals to your living room. HD cable and satellite is in fact not 1080p, with the exception of a couple pay-per-view and on-demand channels. Most providers skipped right over it as an infrastructure needed would have been too expensive to make any large returns on investment, so they opted to have their boxes upscale instead. Take ESPN for example. Even in 2016, most of their audience still views them in 720p because it's the better of the only two options that they have. And it's not ESPN's fault either. This building is 4K ready and 8K capable. We're now in the 1080p range. Uh, not everybody can get that signal yet because the cable companies can't broadcast that, but we are delivering that. So native 4K in broadcast and live TV is still, even years later, almost entirely out of the question. That leaves us with good old streaming video. What's that? I'm forgetting 4K Blu-ray? Yeah, so should everybody else. When a native 4K Blu-ray player costs nearly $250, making the Xbox One S a better value Blu-ray player out of those in the market, and each movie costs an average of $30, it really doesn't fit into our 4K on a budget thing. Anyways, streaming 4K services. YouTube and Netflix are still king. At this price point, we really don't have a reason to focus on extra things like HDR support, so whoever has the most 4K content wins. And these two undoubtedly take the cake. I could not believe the 180 that I did when I got this TV. I used to barely give a shit about 4K on YouTube, even though I exported in it. It was always just a bitrate increase and that's it. My internet could handle it, so I streamed it. And then I saw 4K and a 4K TV and down the rabbit hole I go. Question two, is this TV any good? 55 inches is more than big enough to see the extra detail that 4K provides in most cases. It's noticeably sharper when watching native resolution video, although I'll be the first to tell you that the upscaler, the thing that tries to make low res video look even better, is nothing to write home about. But even though I'm not a fan of the weird smooth edge artifacts the upscaler might introduce, it's the color and brightness that make it better than the average TV. I wasn't lying earlier about this TV being brighter and more vivid than even the big brand names that surrounded it. I don't have any tools to quantify it, like color scanners and nit brightness meters, and as much as I love the Google Pixels and camera, which by the way has been filming this entire video, I still don't think you can convey the quality of a TV through YouTube. As a journalist, it kills We speak when spoken too. As a journalist, it kills me to say something like, just take my word for it. So I'm not going to. I'll encourage you to go to a store that carries it and see it for yourself. Again, this isn't going to go head to head with some OLED HDR panel or anything like that, but for the price, the panel is exceptional, and it looks great out of the box, and if you're like me and have a guilty pleasure with oversaturated colors a la Samsung, the built-in enhanced preset will exceed your expectations. In addition, the audio was surprisingly just above average, especially for a panel with such a thin bezel. 
Don't get me wrong, it's no replacement for a good soundbar, but it can get surprisingly loud before it starts to get distorted, much louder than most rooms will ever need. Once again, it's another feature that's customizable in the settings menu. You're able to change the EQ to fit your needs, whether you want more bass, more treble, or a mixture of both through a predefined preset. And the difference is actually noticeable. And side note, look how smooth these menus are. Everything is snappy, fast, and fluid, which is not something I can say about a lot of similarly priced smart TVs on the market. And that brings us to the main selling point of this TV, Roku OS. All of the software on this TV, from the menus to the apps, is based on Roku's operating system. That means you're not dealing with an inconsistent UI that slows down to a halt every few seconds. Not only is every single app you'd find on a standalone Roku player available on this TV as well, but the fluidity and design language you're already used to is familiar and easy to use. It's essentially just like using a Roku box, except your AV inputs are not only app icons on the home screen, but fully coded in Roku's operating system too. Every menu, option, and setting is written in Roku's code, making configuring apps and customizing the settings actually not a pain in the ass to use. Okay, here you go. <sighs> These sound like minor things, but a whole bunch of them make a major difference. I love how the menus just get out of the way when you're adjusting the image, and it's even smart enough to let you lower the volume while you're muted. The remote itself just emphasizes how simple this TV is to use. I'd show it to you, but... I lost it, but that's okay because I downloaded the Roku app from the iTunes and Google Play Store and suddenly I have the full remote of my phone, except it's better than that. Let's say I want to go on YouTube and search for a video. Doing this is the worst experience that you can have with a smart TV app. Devices like the Nexus Player, Apple TV, and Fire TV try solving this with a voice remote but they can't always pick up lesser known terms. The alternative that Roku provides is an in-app keyboard that sends whatever you type on your phone into the TV. And oh my God, does it make a difference. I'm not scared to look up long titles of specific videos or channels anymore. Sure, Netflix can probably deduce the movie that you're looking for after a few letters because it has a very limited library, but YouTube, not so much. I'm just kidding, by the way. I do still have the remote that comes with the TV, and it's probably going to look really familiar to a lot of you. It looks identical to a standard Roku remote and only has 16 buttons on it. Why? Because that's all it needs. Any other buttons you could possibly need are just an option menu button away. But in all honesty, I understand why the remote is so simple. Because they're the only buttons I ever need when I'm interacting with the TV. So many remotes nowadays are gigantic universal wannabes, mostly because the idea is to have one remote control your TV, cable box, Blu-ray, audio receiver, and more. But I personally don't know anybody that programs their OEM remote to say their DirecTV box, for example, because that box in particular is going to have a UI that's oriented towards that specific remote, the universal one won't have all the buttons it needs, and more. So in that respect, I love how simple and small this remote is, as well as the ability to use my phone as a backup. I even love how they put the volume buttons on the side so they're super easy to hit them without look- Huh. That's really weird. When I hit volume down, it turns off my fan? Question three, is this TV perfect? No, because the remote turns off my fan. Okay, look, I'm not gonna sit here and just sing this TV's praises all day as much as I like it. I'm not one to shy away from buyer's remorse if I ended up getting broken promises at a low price. It's just, there, there's not much in my own specific personal use that I can fault it for. That said, here's a few annoyances I've experienced. The input lag, especially at 4K, is borderline unbearable. I hooked up my PC via HDMI and played Rocket League, Duck Game, and a whole bunch of games on Dolphin Emulator. The frame rate, while limited to 30Hz, was no problem for my GTX 1080, but there was a noticeable delay between pressing a button and seeing something happen on the screen. If you're playing a slower game like GTA 5 that doesn't require perfect response time, it's beautiful to look at but I wouldn't dare queue for a ranked game in Rocket League. There's even a game mode option in the settings menu that promises to improve the response time at the expense of image quality, but I couldn't tell the difference in the response time or the image quality when toggling the setting. Roku OS, while being one of the best TV operating systems I've ever used, is not perfect either. Even while writing this, the YouTube app has crashed a few times in the middle of playing a single video. The Roku app on my phone doesn't always connect and has a 50-50 chance of being able to power on the TV from sleep. The thing is, for once, I'm really not worried about it. Because in the three months that I've owned this TV, I've had two software updates. For a smart TV in this price range, that is unheard of. 
They were simple over the air updates that came from both Roku and TCL. And honestly, I really think the pros outweigh the cons here. One thing that does worry me, however, is the longevity of this TV. This has always been extremely important to me. My little Vizio TV lasted me 10 years. That instills a lot of faith in Vizio as a company for me. And I can only hope that TCL will be able to give me a similar experience. One more thing. While I love how small and basic the remote is, I still, after all these years, cannot stand the app shortcuts at the bottom. I know, I know, Roku gets paid a lot by these companies to be the default buttons, and for them and the companies involved, it's a genius idea. But there's some fundamental problems with this. For example, look at this remote from an earlier TCL TV. See that audio button right there? Literally useless. Why? Audio went out of business, that's why. And no, you can't reprogram it to something else. Now, look, I know that's a pretty extreme example, and I don't expect any of the buttons on the newer ones, like Netflix, to go out of business, obviously. But the point is, I'd much rather that these apps were reprogrammable to other apps, even if it was only on the more premium models. TCL also makes an upgraded version of this TV that's essentially the same exact panel, but with a Roku 3 built into it instead of a 2, which means the remote has a headphone jack and a gamepad. How cool would it be if on the premium model, the app buttons were e-ink displays that you could program to be your favorite apps? You could set them to whatever you want, and it would show the app icon right there on the remote. Okay, now I'm just streaming a little bit, and this is more Roku territory than TCL, so let me get back on track and wrap this up. Question 4. Who is this TV for? Cord cutters. Okay, technically everybody, but specifically cord cutters. I want you to take a look at everything I have plugged into this TV. Number one, power. Number two, that's it. This list is a joke. Because you know what? That's all I really need nowadays. And I'm not trying to say that you have to do this exactly like I do, but this is what I mean about this TV being perfect for me. Because with the exception of plugging my desktop into here to test some input lag, all of the video that I watch on this TV comes over the internet through the apps on their TV itself. Most of the movies and TV come through Hulu and Netflix. Most of my music comes through Spotify and Tidal, and on the rare occasion that I want to watch something live, like a good old game of sports ball, there's an app for that. Let's say I want to follow every Cardinals game this season. Sure, I could call up DirecTV and have them give me another box for this room and an extra monthly fee, but look what I can do instead. Sunday morning football for an NFC team? Fox Sports Go lets me stream it live. Sunday night football primetime? NBC Sports lets me stream it live. Monday night football? Watch ESPN lets me stream it live. Thursday Night Football, NFL Network lets me stream, you get the point. And it isn't just football that works this way either. Thanks to services like Sling TV, PlayStation View, and now DirecTV now, there's full cable packages over the internet coming through apps, which if you're pretty anti-cable company like me, this is music to your ears. But over everything else, I watch a shit ton of YouTube. That's not something that changed just because I'm making a whopping four videos now either. I'm 20 years old and I've virtually grown up with YouTube throughout the years. And more and more, it's becoming my exclusive source for online video. Not like Vimeo stood a chance, but you know what I mean. Personally, I'm more likely to spend a few hours on YouTube than I am watching something on cable or satellite, which makes this TV, once again, perfect for me. The YouTube app is the same one that's available at youtube.com slash TV, which makes it fully featured and consistently up to date. It also supports casting from your phone via the app in case you're moving over from a Chromecast. There's built-in DLNA casting from apps like LocalCast and AllCast, and screen mirroring too. And personally, I just can't think of anything more that I could ask for from a TV. It seems to nail everything that you would look for in a TV while giving you a taste of the future in 4K, while asking for a reasonable, competitive price with virtually no compromise. TCL, if you can fix up the bugs in the OS, deliver a long-lasting lifespan behind the product with little to no deterioration in quality, and get your name out there, you might just be a sleeper hit this holiday season. You ready to go to bed? Yeah, you won't even show your face. I'm ready to go too. Good night, everybody.